Hello and welcome to this course on deconstructing Chupi. My name's Daniel Barnett. I'm an employment law barrister based in central London and I'm going to be guiding you through 10 modules all about the transfer of undertaking protection of employment regulations 2006. Module one is on Chupi uh, applies in business transfer situations. Now, Chupi can seem intimidating. The provisions are complex. The HR processes involved in a Chupi transfer can be detailed, time-consuming and emotional for everyone involved. And what I'm going to be doing throughout this course is aiming to deconstruct the law and explain the relevant principles in simple and practical terms. Now, Tupi, often mispronounced TUP or TUP, TUP is the acronym used to refer to the Transfer of Undertakings Protection of Employment Regulations 2006. TUPI is a legal mechanism which protects employees when the business they work for transfers to a new owner. And TUPI does three important things. Number one, when there's a TUPI transfer, employees transfer automatically from the transfer raw, that's the original employer, they're called the transfer raw, to a new employer who's called the transferee. The transferee steps into the original employer's shoes and inherits all rights, liabilities and obligations in relation to the employees. Second, TUP protects employees against dismissal in connection with a TUP transfer. And third, TUP requires employers to inform and consult representatives of any affected employees before a TUP transfer takes place. Now, this course addresses all three issues and explains the practical things to think about when faced with a potential TUP transfer. In this first module, we'll look at business transfers to see one of the two main situations when TUP applies, the other being service provision changeovers, which we'll discuss in module two. We'll cover the definition of an economic entity, including the needs for stability, and we'll look at when part of a business can be enough to transfer. We'll look at when an economic entity actually transfers to be a TUP transfer, including looking at when things it does post-transfer are similar, but not necessarily identical to before. We'll also look at the significance of gaps in the provision of services. For example, if a restaurant closes down for three months for refurbishment after being transferred to a new owner. Now, TUP applies to a relevant transfer. Regulation 3 of TUP sets out two types of relevant transfer, a business transfer and a service provision change. Business transfers are also known as standard transfers. It's where a business or part of a business moves to a new owner, not by way of share sale, I'll talk about that in module three, but just by way of the transfer of the assets. The identity of the employer has to change to qualify as a business transfer. There's got to be a transfer of an economic entity that retains its identity afterwards. And there are three key elements here. Element number one is there's got to be an economic entity Number two is there's got to be a transfer of that economic entity. And key element three is that economic entity must retain its identity after the transfer. It's a bit like sea, she sells seashells on the seashore. The economic entity must retain its identity after the transfer. You've got to say that quite a lot of times in a, tr in a court or tribunal before it can trip off the tongue naturally. So I'm going to talk about each of those three elements. Regulation 3 2 of TUPI describes an economic entity as an organised grouping of resources which has the objective of pursuing an economic activity, whether or not that activity is central or ancillary. Sometimes it'll be clear that an economic entity has transferred. So if a company sells its entire business to another company as a going concern, well, that's obviously going to be a business transfer. For example, Cleanaway Limited buys the whole of not so cleans cleaning business. Cleanaway takes over premises, takes over equipment and staff of not so clean, and continues to provide the same cleaning services to not so cleans customers. The economic entity here is not so cleans cleaning business. The staff, equipment, and premises are an organized grouping of resources. The organized grouping pursues an economic activity the provision of cleaning services. 
But the economic entity has to be more than just a collection of assets. And certain types of assets are more important to certain types of businesses. So a cleaning company is a labour intensive business. That means that staff are the main asset and the transfer of staff is therefore key to whether TUPI applies. A business can't refuse to take on employees in order to avoid TUPI though because a dismissal is automatically unfair if the sole or principal reason for dismissal is the transfer. That's regulation 7 of TUPI and I'm going to look at TUPI and dismissals in a later module. So in an asset reliant business it can be helpful to look at the core assets of a business to see if they have transferred and are being used in the same way afterwards. If someone's selling a farm, the transfer of the farm land is crucial to the farm's economic activity of farming. If the sale relates to the sale of farm equipment, but without the land, it's probably just a sale of assets rather than the sale of an economic entity which would give rise to a TUPI transfer. The economic entity must be stable. Stability here means that the economic activity must be ongoing when it transfers. A contract to complete a short-term building contract would not be an economic entity because it's too short-term. Again, I'll talk more about that in Module 3. It's not a stable, ongoing activity. In a labour-intensive business like a cleaning business, a stable economic entity would be an organised group of workers who are permanently assigned to particular work, as in our not-so-clean example. The transfer of part of a business can be a TUPI transfer, provided the part is a self-contained economic unit. Any assets, including staff, would need to be grouped together to create a distinct economic entity which can be severed from the rest of the business. So if not-so-clean had separate domestic and commercial cleaning functions, the transfer of only one of those functions to clean away could be a business transfer, provided the rest of the test in TUP is met. Most of the time it'll be obvious when a business transfer has taken place. Usually there'll be a date and a time when the transfer happens and when the new employer takes over responsibility for the employees. So in our example, CleanAway now owns all of Not So Clean's assets and is carrying out cleaning services for Not So Clean's former clients with Not So Clean's former employees. Not So Clean is no longer operating a cleaning business. The entire business of Not So Clean has transferred to CleanAway. Now, sometimes it might not be so clear whether a business has transferred from one company to another. And that can be the case if employers are trying to avoid or ignore TUPI. The key element in a transfer, and this is where a lot of the litigation uh, used to exist before service provision changeovers came in as a thing in 2006 and made it much easier to establish a TUPI transfer. But when dealing with business transfers, the key element in a transfer is that the identity of the employer responsible for running the business has changed. Whether an economic entity is transferred is a question of fact. So it can't be brushed under the carpet or avoided. Just because the old and the new employers say there's been no transfer doesn't make it so. A tribunal or a court will look at the substance of what has happened and decide if there's been a business transfer. A transfer can include mergers, where two companies close and combine to form one new employer. A transfer can happen even if employers are entirely unaware of it. For example, if they've been kept in the dark. We know that the transfer must relate to a, a, a going concern, a business with an ongoing economic activity. Now, the business and its activities must still exist after the transfer. Usually it's easy to establish that. It's not a difficult part of the test. So in our example, CleanAway are carrying on the same business with the same staff for the same clients as Not So Clean did before the transfer. The business looks the same before and after the transfer. But it might not always be so obvious. To establish whether the business has retained its identity, these questions are often helpful and relied on by tribunals. Have physical assets transferred, such as buildings or office equipment? Have most of the employees been taken on? 
Have the customers transferred? Has goodwill, so any value in the brand name or the customer database, has goodwill transferred? How similar are the activities before and after the transfer? And has there been any disruption to activities or a gap in active business? Whether economic activities are similar before and after the transfer will depend on the similarities and differences between the goods and the services sold before and afterwards. So in a case called Matheson and United News Shops, a hospital shop sold newspapers and sweets and gifts, the usual sort of thing. The shop was sold and the new owner changed the business to sell a wider range of convenience food, clothes and electrical goods, as well as newspapers, sweets and gifts. The Employment Appeal Tribunal said that TUP did not apply because the business didn't retain its identity after the sale. It was a different type of shop. There was too big a difference between the goods sold before and after the transfer. A gap in active business won't necessarily prevent there being a transfer. So, for example, a short period of inactivity to acquire an alcohol license wouldn't prevent Tupi from applying to the sale of a bar. A five-month gap in activity didn't stop Tupi applying to a contract to operate a music school in a case called Colino Siguenza, a European Court of Justice case. In that case, three out of the five months were school holidays. This was relevant because activities would have stopped during that period anyway, so in reality, it was a two-month gap in provision. Temporary gaps for good reason are fine, provided the transferred business retains its identity when it restarts. Well, thanks for watching so far. Um, in module two, we'll look at the other situation that gives rise to a TUPI transfer, namely a service provision change.